Today we have on behalf of or from Utilisec, uh, Mr. Justin Cyril, uh -huh. who has spoke at a number of different conferences, including Black Cat and DEF CON. Let's give him a big hand and welcome today. All right, how's everybody doing today? All right, good to hear, good to hear. Okay, so um, at Black Hat, I did a four hour presentation, four hour workshop on this material. You guys get the condensed version of it, but I still have a lot of slides. So we are going to go through the slides. We're not going to hit all the points on the slides, but we are going to have them uh, uploaded to the DEF CON site so you do have availability to uh, all the content. Okay, so first off, um, I am a managing partner for an organization called Utilitech, and we specialize in security services for electric utility companies. Um, we provide penetration testing services, um, secure architecture design, um, and other types of services, including trying to represent the utilities in, and their interest in a lot of the standards that are out there, trying to build in security in some of the standards. In fact, some of the groups that we've worked in um, uh, we have we, we currently lead and facilitate one of our one of our managing partners leads and facilitates the NERC CIPs. Um, that's du Joe Buciero. We also lead many of the different groups that uh, the the electric utilities have put together to try to build security or try to generate industry awareness um, in security issues that we have inside of the smart grid. So the purpose of this talk, a lot of times we hear a lot of different talks, Black Hat, DEF CON, ShmooCon, TorCon, of uh, different types of things in the smart grid. We have a lot of good research going on, a lot of good researchers that are doing a lot of good in this industry. We also have a lot of talks that are smart grid talks that are simply there to try to generate a lot of the hype. So the purpose of this talk is really to try to give everybody a very clear picture of what the smart grid is, give you an idea of, of some of the issues that we're dealing with, some of the different attacks that we're seeing, and some of the different attacks that we perform as penetration testers on the smart grid, um, and, and more importantly, show you that the smart grid is more than just SCADA. The smart grid is more than just smart meters. There's a lot more out there to do, and a lot of the people inside of this audience that are professional sec security professionals your skill sets are very applicable in many areas of the smart grid. You just may not know where to look and, and where to try to generate that, that business. Um, and ultimately, one of the ultimate goals of this talk is to really try to generate more awareness, more interest in the security community, to try to get more researchers and more people in this field. Because um, the smart grid is not perfect. Name a single vertical industry that is secure. We need to get more security. We need more people in this. We need more expertise. And we need more technical expertise in particular. Um, so, so really, that's some of the goals. So the first half of the presentation, we're going to be focusing on um, trying to dig, let you guys understand a little bit more about the smart grid architecture. And then, to, and then the second half, we're going to be talking about some of the different penetration attacks and uh, the defenses that we're recommending and working with vendors and utilities to, to try to address these issues and mitigate them. OK, so first off, what is the smart grid? The smart grid, anytime you hear the term smart grid, this is something very similar to hearing the word internet. Um, it is a marketing term. It can mean anything and everything you possibly ever want. Ultimately, what the goal is of the smart grid is to try to take our existing infrastructure and add additional intelligence to it. Um, add capabilities where in the past we had to have people sitting in the control rooms looking at different sensors coming back and having them sit and toggle the different switches, toggle the different controls to cause reactions in the grid. Um, with this smart grid, we're trying to add more, more infrastructure to be able to give us a, a better view of what's really happening in the grid, a better view of what's happening at the, the homes of each one of you consuming power instead of being able to see once a, once a month um, how much consumption you have, be able to see within a 15-minute interval of, of how, much, how much energy you're consuming. And hopefully this is going to be something to benefit the rest of the community as well. I don't know about you, but I personally want to know exactly how much power I'm using in 15-minute intervals in my house because I can do a lot of really cool things for my own self for that. Um, of course, attackers can do a lot of cool things with that as well. But ultimately, that's, that's the goal. We try to do the same exact thing with the technologies out in the substations themselves. So this is, if you look at this diagram, this diagram goes through and shows you the different elements or different major domains in the smart grid. So we see the ones across the top. We have the markets. We have the operations and the service providers. These are a lot of the, the organizations and the companies that are kind of the glue holding the different processes together. Um, then if you look on the very bottom, we see that dotted yellow line across those four clouds on the bottom. This is the dotted yellow line represents the energy that's flowing from the bulk generation plant to our homes. Okay? All the blue lines are communication lines. So we have a lot of different types of communications between these different entities and these different domains. So this is basically the same exact diagram 
This is showing you just more information and more of the devices. These are the actual systems that you're going to see inside of a lot of the utility companies that are out there in their back offices. So this is all color coded. Um, if you look at the very the yellow part, this is the operations. This is what most of your electric utility companies are, are doing. Um, each one of those boxes um, are a lot of the main control centers. These are some of the major systems that they have to control your power and to monitor your power. If we look in the, actually let me go back just one slide and show you one thing. So bulk generation on the very bottom. Bulk generation, I think that's pretty obvious. These are going to be the power plants, the nuclear power plants, the coal plants that are generating the power for us. That power flows over to a group of, of uh, organizations called transmission operators. These transmission operators are what take this power from the bulk generators down to the distribution operators, which are more the companies that we think of as electric utility companies, because they're the ones that we're buying our power from, and then that power flows back into our home. So the transmission operators and the distribution operators, for the most part, they're, they're very distinct. There are several different organizations and utility companies that act as both. Um, but when we look at this diagram, we see the transmission operators in the upper left-hand corner. These are the transmission field devices, the devices that are on those big giant steel poles with the big power lines that we see cr crossing state borders. <clears throat> My wife and I are Falconers, and, and uh, we always have called these the, the steelies because when we're looking for falcons to trap, the, some of your bigger falcons like the jeers and your, your uh, peregrine falcons like to, like to sit up there in the morning and, and uh, catch the sun as it's rising. So that's how we, how we find the, uh, a lot of those birds. So those are the transmission operators and, and the, their field devices out in the field. The upper right hand corner, that's the distribution field devices. These are the devices that are put out in the field to control the power that's ultimately flowing down to my, and into each one of our houses. Um, that's primarily done through what we call substations. Those are those big things that have the big fences around them, the security cameras, all the barbed wire. Okay, so those are substations. The transmission operator will take this bulk power, they'll drop it down to the distribution operators, usually in one of these, these large substations. And then from there, the power is distributed out to the smaller substations that are closer to our neighborhoods. And each of our neighborhoods then are connected back to those, connected back to those, um, those substations to be able to pull the power. Um, we have different types of devices like feeder switches that allow the utility company to control um, which substation one single neighborhood is connected to. So if you ever have a, a certain circumstance where um, your power goes out and the power is only out for you know, five, five to seven seconds, we're going to have feeder switches and relays that are going to automatically be connecting us back over to another, a different power source. And so that's why you drop out just for a couple seconds and you come right back on. Because they've had some automated event switch you back over to a different power source to try to avoid um, the, the power issues that you're experiencing. Now if we look on the very bottom, um, the things that are probably more interesting to a lot of you are going to be the devices in our home and the lines and the communications between our home and the electric utility companies. That's the bottom right hand corner with all the green. So these are the, the smart meters that are inside of our, inside of our homes um, and the other devices that we ourselves bring, some of our home automation devices, um, those that have electric vehicles. How many people have electric vehicles in this room, out of curiosity? Now that we actually can start buying them in quantity, okay, so we have, we have one or two. Um, so now we can start buying them, we're going to start seeing more of them. Okay, now look at this diagram. This kind of gives you the overall of, of the different components. What I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the labels and remove the nice pretty fluffy clouds and show you the communication links between each one of these devices. Okay, this is what we lovingly call the spaghetti diagram. Okay, this is a diagram that I created for, uh, that I should say Darren Highfield, one of my partners and, and myself, the two of us created this diagram for um, NIST in an interagency report that we released last summer. Um, so if you go back and, and check out this, this NIST report, you can see the, the reference on the very bottom for those that are interested in seeing it, 7628. Um, this, diagram, this, this document is about, I don't know, 700 pages in length, comes up in three different volumes. Um, there's a lot of good information. If you're interested in learning more about some of the issues, some of the more details, some of the concerns, um, some of the, the security architectures and security controls that, that we're recommending at a high level. We realize that this is high level. This doesn't go into to a great amount of detail. Um, that's a great document to be able to get this, that information from. Okay, now what I'm going to do is, you, you see this overall architecture and the communication links. I'm going to point out the different areas that we hear all the buzzwords. Everybody has heard buzzwords like SCADA, right? Everybody's heard buzzwords smart grid, or excuse me, smart meters. Um, I'll show you exactly where each one of those different areas are. So first off, the SCADA. 
When we talk about SCADA, these are the, the types of devices that allow us to read sensor information from the field and be able to have then make decisions on sensor information and send control signals back out to the field to cause reactions and changes in, in our real world environment. Um, so you can see those, those blue sections in the upper right hand corner that are circled. Those are going to be the sensors in the different devices, um, IEDs. And other types of devices, yes, IEDs does have another, another meaning inside of the smart grid. Um, and RTUs, the devices that are controlling the, a lot of the devices out there and the, the central brains that usually collect a lot of the sensor information and send it back. Okay, we're using SCADA protocols to send those back to what we call our back-end SCADA systems. Um, we, this, so here, that one single yellow box that's circled is our distribution SCADA. Um, in the smart group, we have several different protocols that we use. Um, some of the earlier protocols like, like Modbus, serial communications um, across, across basic serial lines. Um, then as history went forward, we started taking that serial communication, packetizing it, throwing it on TCP IP streams or UDP streams, sending it back across the you know, higher bandwidth lines back to the organization. Um, and you know, some of the newer protocols, DNP3 is probably one of the most commonly used SCADA protocol in the electric sector here in the United States. Um, a lot of these protocols have very, very limited security and it's something we're trying to address. We're trying to build new protocols to replace them. Um, DMP3 being the most popular one, it's only been about two years ago that we even had uh, even encryption capabilities inside of DMP3. Um, and we are looking at replacing DMP3 with additional protocols that have much stronger security models. Um, so that's, that's distribution. Transmission SCADA is very similar as well. Of course, they have their own field devices out there. There's usually their own SCADA, um, uh, transmission SCADA server that's controlling a lot of those, those, uh, those signals. And this, you can see that there are some communication links between the, the distribution and the transmission devices. Um, and then we have, last but not least, the, the bulk generation. Um, generation plants, nuclear power plants, all those guys, yes, they have more infrastructure than what we show with this one single box. Um, the reason why it's only one box is that was, for the most part, out of scope other than the lines of communication between those, those bulk, bulk generation and the utilities themselves. It was out of scope for the work that we were doing for NIST. Um, so that's why you only see that one box. But realize that there's a lot, of, a lot more technology and a lot more devices and communication links inside of the, the bulk generation. Okay, the next, the next buzzword we want to talk about is the electric vehicles or the PEVs. Um, a lot of us that are bringing these back to our house, right now they're fairly simple in their communications model modules. For the most part, um, when you get a PEV, you are going to be talking to your electric utility company and they'll usually either issue you a second separate electric meter for your house that's specific towards your, your, uh, your electric vehicle because each one of these electric vehicles on average consume about the same amount of power to charge its batteries as your whole, your whole entire house uses. Um, so there's a lot of power going on there. Um, each utilities are trying to find different ways and different strategies to try to deal with additional load inside of, inside of our infrastructure. So part of that's with separate meters. Um, sometimes they'll have you just plug into your normal, your, normal, your normal links inside of your house, but then you usually end up getting charged more. Uh, most of the utilities will give you a, 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 price, a, price, a price break by having the, the separate meter in there. Um, right now, like I said, there's, there's little to no communications. There's a lot of work going on with, with communications to be able to allow your PEV to communicate back to the electric utility vehicle. Um, it'll be interesting to see whatever happens with this, but part of, one of the initiatives and some of the vendors that are out there um, are trying to get to the point where the electric vehicle can self-identify itself. And when you plug power in or plug your vehicle into your, either your employer or your neighbor's house or some family member's house, um, a lot of people in the industry have this idea that they want to be able to charge, track where your vehicle goes and, and it still gets paid on your bill, no matter if you're plugging into your neighbor's house or your family's house or somewhere else. Of course, this becomes a security nightmare, um, trying to tie this together, especially when we start mixing up different uh, electric utility companies. For most of us in the States, it's fairly easy. Each regional or each city or each town is, is tied to one single electric utility vendor. Um, it's not quite as easy a case with you know, those people down in that little state called Texas. Um, they're a little bit different beast for, for most of us um, in the electric sector. Okay, the next area, synchrophasers. Synchrophasers are another technology. Now, for those of, the, those of the people in the room, who understands the difference between a digital multimeter and an oscilloscope? Raise your hand. Okay, so right now, if you want to think about it, 
the way that the way that in general, once again, this is oversimplification, but in general, the way that the electric utilities right now are controlling and measuring the power inside of inside of the grid is more or less with a whole bunch of really smart digital multimeters that are just, that are um, in all the different substations that are taking readings on average about every two seconds to find out what's going on, how much power is being used, how much voltage is there, and all the other pertinent measurements that they need. Um, they realize that. While that's necessary, while that's good, they have some good information, it's not quite as finite as they need. And so they're trying to employ additional te technologies to give them something that's more visibility like you would see with an oscillosc oscilloscope. Instead of just getting a, a, a digital number telling you what, your, what the power is, they're putting these devices out that will more or less let them recreate that sine wave or what the power is really doing and how it's really flowing. Um, they actually call these with phasers and they do the phase angles to try to figure that out. These measurements, these synchrophasers are making, making readings of the power um, at minimal 30 times per second. Um, at maximum, a lot of the vendors are doing up to about 120 and there are some discussions about pushing it all the way up to, to 240 times per second you know, down the future, in the future. But right now, I'd say probably uh, you know, 30 to 60 seconds or 30 to 30. 30 to 60 times per second are what most of the, the utilities that are deploying these synchrophasers are, are trying to get to, to give them a little bit better idea on what the power looks like at one end, at one state to the other state across their whole domain. Because in general, that sine wave should be nearly identical across the whole entire grid. Um, the United States is actually broken into to three separate grids. We have the east, we have the west, and we have Texas. Like I said, there. They're, they're kind of their own entity and their own beast, and they have uh, a little bit different uh, legal and political issues to deal with as well when it comes to power. Um, so that's what the synchrophasers are. The synchrophasers are primarily being used by your transmission operators, the people that are actually pushing the, the power long distances. Um, they are, this information is also being sent back up to what we call regional coordinators. Um, regional coordinators are entities in the United States that try to work with the transmission operators and um, help the transmission operators, you know, make sure that the power is balanced out, make sure that, that we have a nice stable grid. So there's about 15 different regional coordinators inside of the United States that help try to manage, manage this power. Okay, the next smart, uh, the next uh, buzzword we usually hear about are the smart meters themselves. Okay, while these are definitely fun devices to play around on, this is something that is, is a relatively minor and uh, a minor issue that we have um, compared to a lot of the other issues that we're, that we're facing with the smart, with the smart grid. So down here, you can see that the smart meter in that, in that bottom right-hand corner, the, the one right in the middle, that's going to be an, an interface that is usually deployed on the meter itself. It's not necessarily a, its own device in most circumstances for residential people. When we get into larger deployments for um, corporations and more so even in industrial, um, there's going to be a separate interface to be able to control and manage all the different meter readings that are, that are deployed out there. Um, so this is where the meter is. There's lines of communications between the smart meters that are being deployed back to the electric utility company um, to what we call a head end that's in the back of the electric utility company. Um, with with, uh, with this, this infrastructure, um, traditionally, for, for most of the people inside of this room, most of you do not have the new smart meters on the sides of your house. If you're interested to find out what type of meters you have on the side of your house, just simply go out there, look to see who the manufacturer is, look to see what the model is. It's usually very visible right on the front of the meter. Punch that into Google and you can get spec sheets on any of these meters to tell you information about what capabilities it supports. Um, a lot of you will be able to go to the meters and you'll, you'll find that, that information. You'll also see this little acronym that's ERT on the, front, the face of the meter. Um, what ERT is, is this is a protocol that um, probably the majority of us inside of this room have inside of our meters. This is not the new smart meter technology. This is a one-way broadcast um, protocol that the meters will go through and protocol and about every two minutes what their, their data consumption is. Um, so one way, there's no way to be able to use this communication protocol to talk back to the meter. Um, and it's broadcast out using a, a 900 megahertz protocol. It does frequency hopping. It, well, it doesn't even do frequency hopping. It randomly chooses, when it comes up to its, its time, its allotment every two seconds, it randomly chooses one of 40, 40 channels to broadcast that information on. Um, so that way it tries to avoid you know, stepping on top of anybody else inside of the, inside of the neighborhood. Um, that's what we have with the meter readers. They used to have to come up and read the meter themselves. Now they can just do drive-bys because they're collecting these ERT signals that are being sent back out. There are other protocols besides ERT. There's also some that, that, uh, trans, that uh, transmit and communicate over the power lines themselves. Uh, but the ERT is probably the most commonly deployed <coughs> 
um, precursor or, or you know, semi-intelligent meter um, that, are, that are being deployed right now. In fact, we call these meters AMR meters, um, these ones with the one direction communications that are out there, um, as opposed to AMI meters, AMI meaning the, the more intelligent ones that have bi-directional communications. Um, the AMI meters, the new smart meters, their deployment is relatively small. Um, depending on the research that you see, you can, you'll, you'll see that uh, deployments anywhere from 10 to 25 percent um, across the U.S. Um, once again, there's, there's a lot of debate on, on, on uh, the exact number of, the, of those smart meters out there and exactly what's the difference between some of the smart meters and what are not some of the smart meters. So to dig a little bit deeper into the smart meters themselves, and that generates a lot of interest, um, and, this is, and this in general, if we, if we take all the detailed information out and abstract this to a, a generic architectural view, this is true for most of the field devices um, in general that we, that we deploy in the smart grid, just differences of protocols and the exact terms of the devices. But when we look at the AMI meters themselves and these smart meters, we see on that far left hand side of this diagram the electric utility company themselves um, and all their back end systems that's reading this information. Um, the very first device that's part of the AMI network, these servers that are purchased with the meters, are going to be these head ends. These head ends usually are protected by some type of a firewall or some type of, of perimeter that they set up before we get out to the field devices. Um, then, of course, we'll hit some routers, and the routers will then put it back out, for the most part, out to the ISPs and the, util the uh, telco companies that, that are connecting to them. Um, most of the meter data is, is going across cellular connections. So you can see that the different links we have there, um, the good majority is through cellular connections out to these meters. We do have some, some proprietary and third-party offered RF towers. Um, we also had in certain circumstances, especially in the case of industrial, industrial customers, we'll have leased lines out to each one of these. Um, these communications for the, the meters go down then, these control signals or when they tell the uh, shut the power off at your house, will go down to what we call um, the drop point or the aggregator for the network. Um, these aggregators are devices that are deployed out in the field, um, either as a pull-top device up on top of a pole or as a, a meter, kind of a more intelligent meter that's placed on the side of one, one house inside of your neighborhood. Um, you can tell when you have these, these takeout points or these, these aggregator meters when they're on the side of somebody's house because in general these will usually be sticking out a few inches further than all the other ones inside of the neighborhood. Um, because they have to make room for that additional communications. Namely, they have to make room for the uh, cellular communication module that's inside of the device. Beyond that, um, in some deployments and some of the vendors that have these smart meter products that are being sold, they will have, some of them will be deployed with cellular modems in every single one of the meters, but I would say that the vast majority of the vendors that are selling here in the United States instead will have a meshing technology set up um, so that all the meters inside of the neighborhood will set up a, a communications mesh to get that data and assemble that data back to the takeout point or the, the aggregator to push that back up to the utility company itself. Um, of those devices that have this mesh network, it's, it's, it's rather interesting. Um, every single one of the vendors that are out there, while they may while they may be using meshing technology, and almost every single one of them is using a 900 megahertz frequency to do that meshing technology, every single one of the meshing technologies and frequency hopping patterns of those 900 megahertz spectrum communications is different. Um, generally, what the, the, the vendors are doing is they're, they're choosing chips from TI and the other different types of, of communication chips that are out there that are you know, generic off the shelf commodity hardware chips for their boards. They're taking these, they are taking the configuration file that, that dictates the frequency hopping. They'll build their own frequency hopping algorithm and the frequency hopping patterns based on a number of different factors. Um, by changing the frequency hopping, they can change the amount of bandwidth and the amount of distance they can get out of some of the, some of the devices. So they'll tweak that to get the magic numbers that that, that vendor is interested in. And then on top of that, they'll build the meshing protocol. And every single meter vendor out there that has a mesh network has their own proprietary mesh network. Um, there's no shared technology between the meshing technologies. Above that meshing technology, we'll see uh, a combination of, of vendors. I would say probably about 50% of them are using a standard protocol for meter communication called C1222. Um, each one of them, of those 50% that are using C1222, um, even their implementations are different. While they meet the specification, to the letter, they don't necessarily meet it to the point where it's interoperable with anybody else for, because of a number of different factors. Um, the other 50% of the vendors out there for communications, they're going to be using a TCP IP connection, um, either IPv4 or IPv6, depending on the vendor, um, and then pushing either their own proprietary protocol across it, 
um, either raw C1219 tables, which is C1219 tables or how each of the meters actually store their data inside of the meters themselves, um, or they are going to be using some standard protocols. They might be using some uh, web services across it. There's, there's not many vendors out there doing web services um, or XML data streams and exchanges on those meters, but there's a couple that are, that are doing that here in the United States. Um, of this area of the mesh, when we think mesh, wireless mesh at 900 megahertz, most of us automatically think Zigbee, at least in the field. Um, as I realized, or as, as, as I wanted to clarify, I did mention that every single vendor is using their own proprietary one. That means that nobody is using mesh for this meter to meter network neighborhood. Um, every single one uses a proprietary. The place where most of these devices are using Zigbee, which most of them do have Zigbee modules in them, are between the meter down to the devices inside of our house. Okay, so that's where the Zigbee communications come into play. Um, and so if you get these slides later, you can go through and, and see some of the different protocols and dig a little bit more into it. If we look at the payloads that are being sent across, to give you a high-level idea of what happens in the type of communications that pass back and forth between these devices, I have gone through and listed out some of the different payloads. Notice that the first block of, of payloads primarily are communications between the meters themselves and the head end. Um, the, the, the one below it, the three lines below it, at the very bottom of the slide, these are pass-through communications. So these are going to be the communications that come from the, the, Zigbee, the Zigbee network inside of our home area network, the devices inside of our house, passing back to the utility company. Um, these, these will usually either be tunneled across the, the connection in some situations, or they will simply be um, data inside of those C, some of the C1219 tables that are being passed with whatever communicated communication protocols are there, the hand end will simply pull out that input from that table, pass it back on to whatever devices need it on the back end. Um, for the most part, a lot of the, the utility companies aren't doing a lot of this pass-through communications yet. It's there for future use. Um, some of the goals that they have is with demand response programs. Um, this is where a utility would give you a discount to the power that you're paying um, in order to allow them to have some limited control of some of your high consumption devices in your house, like your AC unit, um, during times of peak load. So for instance, um, in, I, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. A lot of people up there, the electric utility company, Rocky, Pow Rocky Mountain Power, um, give this discount if you have this device called a cool keep or put on, put on your house between your AC unit and the, the control unit of your house. And what this does is in the, in the middle of July when it's the hottest, highest temperatures, um, when it becomes a threat to the power stability inside of Salt Lake because we're having a bit of a power issue up there over the last couple of years, um, they can go through and they can power cycle for small intervals the AC units inside of the neighborhoods. And they'll actually do this in a coordinated fashion where they'll take approximately one-fifth to one-eighth of the, the AC units inside of the neighborhood. They'll cycle them down for five minutes or seven minutes. Um, and then they'll go ahead and let them come back up and then they'll cycle down the next, the next fifth for that amount of time. So that way they're at least trying to decrease some of the load inside of the grid. And they've had a lot of success with doing this. Um, and you know, as customers, we, we appreciate that to some degree, except for on the hottest days when they actually start turning the cycling on. But otherwise, it's, it's, these are some of the different types of programs they have. Um, expect to see additional demand response, question, um, demand response programs here in the future. Um, on the meter communications themselves, we have some basics. Of course, we have the, the consumption data that's coming back to the, the head ends themselves. We have control signals to be able to turn off power at the house. Them, the house. Um, part of the reason why they have these communications in there is when people move out, um, it's always been a big problem have people going in and squatting inside of the houses and getting, getting free power. Um, so now when you call up and say, hey, I'm moving, can you go ahead and, and remove it from the bill? They can immediately just shut down power at your house. When you move in, you can call up and say, hey, can you re-enable power? They can do that while you're right on the phone with them. Um, that one piece of functionality, that remote disconnect, is probably the, the greatest threat from a, sec from a security perspective of these meters. Um, I would say the other major threat from these meters themselves is realize that these meters are collecting information and sending them back to a controlling server on the back end. And any time we have data passing, input data from a meter back to a controlling server on the back end, there isn't a chance for an attack there. Um, I've never seen any good proof of concept code to be able to, to attack any of these head ends, um, but that still is a, a concern in my book and, and something that I think personally deserves a little bit more research that are out there. 
um, seeing if you can take the few input fields that those head ends are accepting from the meters and, and seeing if you can get a buffer overflow or some other type of an attack to gain control of that head end. Because ultimately that would give you the most control over these meters themselves. Um, there are other attacks out there with vulnerabilities. Um, if you can find the right combination of vulnerabilities, um, you might be able to get in and try to, to control some of the other meters remotely by building your own devices to, to build this, to communicate on these mesh networks. Or if you repurpose one of the meters and try to make it so it communicates on it. If you can get the right combination of vulnerabilities, you can do a thing and attack the meters remotely. Um, the good thing is, is most of these meter manufacturers are on their third and fourth generation products right now. Um, if you go back and look at the first generation products, it was a huge nightmare and very, very much a possibility um, to be able to perform these types of attacks. With the current models right now, with these third and fourth generation deploy devices that are currently being deployed, um, it's, it's a much harder, harder attack surface to be able to find that right combination of, of vulnerabilities to attack that infrastructure. Most of them are doing a, a fairly decent job now with their security infrastructure and security architectures. Okay, so attacks and defenses. That gives you a little bit of an idea of what the, the architecture looks like. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the attacks that we perform as, as penetration testers and some of the defenses. Okay, so this is an oversimplified chart. Realize this is not what a utility company really looks like. This is highly oversimplified. This just goes through to show that we have client-side attacks, server-side attacks, network attacks, just like any other industry. Um, we do have that additional um, vector of network attacks in the field devices and the hardware attacks on these devices as well. Um, so really fast, client-side attacks, it is a threat, honestly. Out of all the attacks that are out there inside of the smart grid, all the attacks that we can do to the meters on our homes, all the attacks we can do to the, the big iron um, products in the transmission operator substations that are out there, um, at the end of the day, these are the things that personally keep me up at night, the things that I'm most worried about. Because electric utility companies are just like any other organization out there. They have internet links, they have clients that are surfing the web. And while they're, they're, for the most part, they're control center technicians and control center operators, they don't have direct internet access on their workstation. They do have um, connectivity to um, services and different devices inside of the organization. So if an attacker comes in through the front door through a client side attack, gets a presence inside of the organization, it's only a matter of time before he can get his way and work his way to the right workstations and the right subnets to be able to gain access to some of these servers. Um, so that's what keeps me up at night. I personally think when, the day when we see the biggest um, incident from attackers um, that affect us from the smart grid, I personally think that the, the front doors, the launch of this attack is going to be coming through a uh, client side attacks. Okay, server side attacks, nothing different here. Um, same vulnerabilities. Realize that all these control servers that I showed you, uh, the ones that are controlling all the communications for the SCADA networks and for the AMI meters, this is commodity operating systems on commodity hardware. Okay, so the things that everybody in this room does for penetration testing of devices, your, your knowledge is directly applicable here um, for the server side attacks. And just like any other industry, we have a lot of the controlling interfaces are moving from fat client type control interfaces and serial and terminal interfaces, they're moving to web-based interfaces as well. So things like cross-site request forgery immediately become problematic. And for those of you that do web pen testing, you know cross-site request forgery is out there and probably 95 to 98% of every single web interface you ever touch. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a, a huge issue, and, and this is something that's a very valid attack angle for us. Okay, network attacks. In the network attacks, when we're looking at the field devices, inside the organization, it's just like anything else. Okay, most of the protocols, most of those devices that you saw in the earlier architecture diagrams that have communications, most of those are using um, web services and other types of very common protocols that we're, most, that we're used to dealing with. When we get to the field devices, we get a lot of proprietary one-off one -off protocols, especially when we get to the substations, because for, the, for a lot of the, the devices that were deployed in the substations in the last 20 to 30 years, a lot of them were custom built um, for each one of those, those utilities. And so they're very, very customized proprietary languages. I mean, even when we have standard languages, like I told you, C1222 for the meters, um, each of the vendors are doing customizations of each one of those protocols as well. So when we look at network attacks, um, for the most part, when we do penetration tests, if we have enough time and enough budget, we will go through and try to reverse engineer into the proprietary protocols that are out there. But a lot of times, just like it always is the case when we do pen testing, there's always limited budgets to work with. And so we always want to at least do a very, very simple check of the network communication protocol for, for some basics. Um, some of the base that we're going to be checking for is going through and checking for um, the cryptography that they're using, checking for encryption. I'm um, just trying to see if they actually have encryption enabled at all. 
Um, other thing we, we often see is for the wireless communications is um, a misconception that frequency hopping is one of their security controls. Okay? Frequency hopping is not a security control. With the right equipment and enough time, you can go back and you can backtrack and trace what that frequency hopping algorithm is and, and bypass that. It's more of a method for obscuring than anything. And, and ultimately, the reason why we do frequency hopping isn't for security. It's ultimately be able to provide a higher quality of communications. Okay. We also see a problem, problems with communications with cryptography because a lot of the protocols that we're used to dealing with cryptographic protocols in normal IT um, simply are too heavy handed and, and the, the embedded devices that we're deploying don't have that capability. So we have very limited capabilities for some of these devices. So a lot of times we're going to be messing with asymmetrical, with, excuse me, symmetrical encryption, AES encryption. Um, because it's a lot easier to have these embedded devices use it. We do have some asymmetrical protocols out there, but there's very few um, asymmetrical options that we have at our disposal. So when, we, when we're dealing with these, with these protocols, one of the first things that we're interested in is how they do their key updates and key distribution, um, because that's one of the biggest weaknesses in Achilles' heels to symmetrical encryption. When we get a proprietary protocol that we've never messed with before, or never seen before, the first thing we're going to do is, we'll, if, if we're going to try to determine whether it's an encrypted protocol or not, and if it is encrypted, try to determine how encrypted it is. So here's some charts just showing you um, different ways to, to determine. You capture the packets, you strip out any of the header information, you take just the payload, we do a, hist we do a, we build a histogram um, checking the entropy of the data inside of the payloads themselves. Um, the graph on the chart, uh, the, the graph on top, is going to be, this is the, the, uh, the prime model, this is the one that we want to see when we see, when we want to see encryption, something that's very, very evenly distributed out. The one on the bottom is still encrypted, but it's not as, as good as in its encryption mechanism because we don't have quite the, the any, even number of balance. And if you ever see, when you're doing this, this uh, histogram and the comparison, if you ever see a, a large jump right in the very middle and it right back down, usually it means you've come across a, an ASCII-based protocol because you hit the big jump right in the, all the middle with the ASCII characters and very, very few representation anywhere outside of, inside of those uh, common ASCII characters. Um, so another, another issue we have is, is in the, the web word world, we have products, vendors that are selling web-based products that say, yes, we're secure because we use SSL and TLS. Okay, we have the same exact problem we have inside of the embedded world. Um, we have vendors coming up and saying, yes, we're secure because we use 8YES. Um, so one of the first questions we're always going to be asking is what types of cipher modes are you using for your AES and trying to start digging down into the architecture there. Okay, of the hardware attacks. Okay, the hardware attacks does represent not just the meters themselves. This can be performed by any of the pull top devices like um, the aggregation points or the feeder switches. Um, this also takes effect of the RTUs and the different devices and the substations themselves. Um, of, these hardware, of those hardware attacks, um, most of these are susceptible to different types of physical attacks themselves, either just getting in and trying to get information back out or making some modifications in the hardware themselves. A lot of the vendors that are out there have minimal capabilities or, or minimal controls around trying to detect when people are tampering with these devices, um, but for the most part, they're, they're fairly, fairly weak. When we are trying to attack each one of these hardwares, the primary purpose for us to perform a penetration test on one single piece of hardware isn't to compromise that hardware. Just like everybody in this room knows, when you have physical access to the computer, we assume everything on that computer is compromised with some minor exceptions and some edge cases. Um, same thing with the meters themselves um, and any of the hardware field, the embedded hardware devices deployed to the field. We get our hands on these devices not to show that we can attack these devices and, and get information off these devices. We attack these devices to try to identify vulnerabilities and to try to get information to enable us to attack the other devices inside of the infrastructure. Some of the things I'm going to be looking for are the cryptography keys, the, the symmetrical or the asymmetrical cryptography keys that are stored on these devices. Because with access to this information, I can go through and I can attack the other devices inside the infrastructure, either directly, let's say I can get the infrared password, because all the meters have that little infrared interface, that's a little round thing with the two little dots in on the front of your meter. It's an infrared interface. Um, if you can get the infrared interface, of course, I can go through and just very quickly launch attacks to each one of the other meters inside of the neighborhood. But what I'm more interested in is getting the keys for the, the wireless mesh communication protocols, because if I can get the asymmetrical or the symmetrical keys for that, if I, and I can find a vulnerability in the way that they've been implemented, I might be able to launch other types of attacks like impersonating another meter or impersonating the head end and, and sending control signals down to the other meters from, from my, my device. Okay, another thing we have is with energy theft. 
of these meters. This is something we've had forever. There's, it's not a new thing. Ever since they've had power, people have been stealing power from the, the meters themselves. There's a lot of information. Any of these terms, if you just punch them into Google, you'll be able to get some details, information about how people have done this in the past and some of the, some of the attacks. This is basic stuff, simply trying to steal power. That's not all that interesting to us, but it is kind of fun to talk about, especially when you see really cool pictures like this of people stealing power, piggybacking multiple meters together, ripping the meter out, just uh, getting in and actually hardwiring communications back to one single meter or uh, usually outside of that one single meter so it's not being read at all. Um, we also have physical bypass. A lot of these devices are being tried to protect with different controls like locked cases and lock boxes on them and fences and perimeters and security cameras and all these things. Of course, locks, we can pick the locks. Fences, we can climb the fences. Um, cameras, well, number one, if they have cameras. Number two, if they have cameras, they actually, do they actually monitor them? If they do monitor them, how long does it take to roll something out? If you get a good attack, and you can actually replicate this attack and make it, make it uh, very easy to go through and launch, you can go to each of the different um, substations, launch your little attack, get back out within a 10, 15 minute minute, at least give you some remote presence, some wireless remote presence inside of that substation to be able to go through and, and continue your attack down the road. So these are things that we're trying to combat, some of the things that we're trying to address inside of the smart grid. When we're working with the hardware itself, I told you we're looking for uh, keys in the hardware. Um, we want to go into these keys and try to extract these keys out. Two methods that we use for extracting these keys out is either going through on these hardware devices and identifying where the data is stored at rest. Um, so the EEPROMs, the RAM chips, um, the flash memory inside the chips, the onboard storage of the, uh, the system on the chips and the microprocessors. Trying to gain access to those and dump the data back off of them. Another thing that we'll do is we'll go in and, and identify communications between the microprocessor and other keys like the wireless, or other chips on the board like the wireless board, and we'll jump in and we'll sniff the, the bus communications off those devices, trying to find those key exchanges. Um, this, is, this is something that we'll occasionally find is in order to set up the encryption, if a lot of the encryption is being done by the microprocessor and the RF chip itself is just a very, very dumb chip building the, the median for it to communicate on, um, we, we might not be able to get any data off because the data is already becoming encrypted. But if that RF chip has more intelligence and is doing the encryption itself, quite often the data is being passed plain text in a serial link across that bus to the chip. And quite often that key is also being sent clear text over that chip as well because the key is part, usually stored on the microprocessor itself. So if we can capture that key back off, we can get access to uh, the cryptography keys for the communications channel. So these are just some pictures of going in, showing how we jump in on some of the different devices, connect different wires to it. Um, using syringes, that one thing on the left-hand side, that's a big syringe that we use. Makes us, it makes it very easy to use a syringe to go in and get some of the small surface-mounted um, pins that are on the devices themselves. Um, occasionally, we have to go through and make some minor modifications to try to get chips out of the way from interfering with our communications and try to um, stop the attacks that we're doing. Uh, we avoid this when possible. It's not always possible. Um, here's just a little screenshot of us going through and dumping out the contents in EEPROM, um, usually using either the I2C or the SPI communication buses on these chips themselves. So basically bypass the microprocessors, get our own hardware and straight into that EEPROM or the flash module and dump the contents out. Um, here's an example of bus snooping, identify the bus, jump in between uh, the two chips that we're trying to get the capture of the information from and, and capture that information so we can go back and do analysis later. Once we capture that information, we have to identify the information that we want out of the side of this, this dump, because a lot of times these dumps are very, very cryptic. Two different ways to do this. If we have symmetrical encryption keys, we do attacks very similar to the attacks that they did with uh, the Blu-ray disks, where we systematically go through and take um, the, the exact length of the key that we know that they're using, and we systematically step through the memory dump until we find a key that successfully decrypts whatever traffic we're trying to, trying to, to decrypt. If you see here in the very bottom, this is a combination of Travis Goodfett's uh, Goodfett tool and Josh Wright's Killer B protocol that we do this attack in when we're dealing with Zigbee. So dump the, dump the memory contents off of a, a, Zigbee, a Zigbee chip or grab it straight out of RAM. We then use that binary dump to step through it until we can successfully decrypt a, a Zigbee packet. Asymmetrical is even easier. Asymmetrical keys are randomly, ra pseudo randomly generated. Okay, so all we do is we, we go through and do an entropy analysis of the dump we have, and as long as the rest of the data on, the, on the, the device is not encrypted, you can very easily decide exactly where that asymmetrical key is. So you see that one spike right in the middle, that was the asymmetrical key inside of this, inside of this dump. Um, so they're fairly easy to identify. 
once we, once we go through and we have this information, once again, the goal is to try to leverage this for other purposes. Um, some of the defenses we're recommending for the utilities is, is try to use system on a chip as one of the best defenses they have, as well as try to limit the cryptographic keys that they're deploying um, out to the other devices. Um, another item that we're going to be using or looking for besides the key itself is, is the firmware. Um, because with the keys, while we can get the keys, it's, it's all great, fine, and dandy. If we can get the firmware itself, the firmware gives us capability and greater insight to these devices. And you can go through and use these or binary, um, binary decomp decompilation and go through and analyze the binary itself or do source code review on the device. Um, those are two different options if you have a copy of the source code. Um, if you are going to be doing binary analysis on the flash, it, it does become a little more problematic than most of you doing binary analysis on, on common everyday computers because each one of these embedded devices has different microprocessors with different instruction sets. So you quite often will have to go through and build decompilers to try to simply gain access to the instructions in the first place. Um, so that's a, a huge obstacle that we come across. And um, for those that like writing decompilers, uh, we could definitely use a lot more of them out there from the embedded chip space. So great, huge opportunity for you to get into. Other than that, uh, for conclusion, yes, the smart grid's out there. The smart grid does have security issues out there. No industry is perfect. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we're moving forward, and we have a lot of people looking at these devices, and we can always use more. Um, for those that are running security shops out there and providing security services, um, realize that there's a huge potential inside of the smart grid with working with the vendors of the smart grid as well as the, the utility companies that are buying these products. Um, your skills are directly applicable in many of the different areas, and for those that want to learn new skills, there's a lot of new skills out there you can pick up with uh, some of the hardware hacking techniques and some of the proprietary uh, networking protocols um, that are out there. So a lot, of, a lot of good information out there. If you want more information, you can go through and check out a, a couple different resources. Throughout the slide deck, I try to give resources wherever I possibly could. Um, if you want more information about some of the attacks specific, um, my previous employer in Guardians, they do have on their website uh, an attack methodology that goes a little bit more into detail about some of the hardware attacks that are out there. Um, that's a great source. Um, of course, I did mention the NIST interagency report that was released last summer. You can go through and grab that. The URL's up there. Um, and then also, if you go to Smart Gridipedia, it's a great place to get information. And specifically on Smart Gridipedia, there is uh, ASAP SG, one of the work groups that uh, I've been working on for the last two years. All the products that we create and all the documents that we create to try to help the utility secure their, their, their infrastructure, we post publicly on this, on, this, on this website. You can gain access to any of these and get inform information about any of the specific domains that I've spoken about today. Um, other than that, thank you very much. I will go ahead and take questions in Q&A, but thank you. It's been good.